Um, I'm Jessica Bowser Acree. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the program director of the Masters of Arts Management program at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, which is a joint program between the College of Fine Arts and the Heinz College of Public Policy and Information Systems. The Masters of Arts Management program strives to increase capacity, effectiveness, expertise, and impact of, of management in the arts. And today's MAM speaker series will hopefully help achieve those goals. Um, we are in Zoom, as I've said a couple of times, um, but please consider remaining on mute unless you are asking a question and we will have time for questions at the end. Uh, feel free to type your questions into chat and I will help um, Nick read those questions when we do get to the end. But we'll also, if you're feeling brave and want to answer the or ask the question, you know, we'll, if you want to put your Zoom ham up when it comes time for questions, we'll do that as well. Um, and with that, I am going to keep this introduction as brief as possible so we can spend as much of the hour together um, in the panel because we had a great pre-panel meeting for this and just the discussion we were having in that quick half hour was more exciting than anything I would say in an introduction. So allow me to introduce our panel moderator, uh, MAM alum Nick Kozik. And uh, Nick, I'm gonna allow you to introduce yourself and begin the panel. Thank you so, so much for today. And uh, we can not unmute, but we can all clap to acknowledge that we're all here. If we unmute, then we'll all have that background noise, but maybe we'll all mute at the end. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jessica. Um, hello, everyone, and a welcome to this panel. I'm Nick Posick, Assistant Director for the Parker School of Foreign and Comparative Law at Columbia University, and as Jessica mentioned, a MAM alum. Um, thank you all for joining this afternoon, and thank you for Jessica um, for helping to organize this panel, and to Ross for helping out in a myriad of ways. Um, I'm pleased to moderate this discussion with this fantastic group, and rather than recite the many accolades of, um, each panelist has earned, I want to set a more conversational tone um, and invite each panelist to introduce himself or herself. Um, maybe we could start with um, E. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nick and Jessica, for inviting me to be on the panel today. And it's always a pleasure to connect with MAM students and students past and present at CMU at large. Uh, my name is Yi. I graduated from CMU in um, MAM program in 2014 and currently work in the Arts of Asia department as the curatorial uh, administrative uh, director at the Art Institute of Chicago. And prior to this position, I was in Pittsburgh. Um, I was the curatorial and education program manager at the Carnegie Museum of Art. So I'm very excited about this panel because you have worked on collaborative projects with um, uh, artists and uh, art administrators from museums in China as a Chinese person representing US museums. So this duality of being both an insider and outsider has provided a lot of opportunities and challenges to really understand how museums in China work. Okay, I'll stop here and uh, we can chat more later. All right, Judy, you're next on my screen. Hello everyone, I'm Judy Tai. Um, and like Ian, e, also the alum of MAM program. Um, currently I'm working at New York Foundation for Art as the director of grants. Uh, so we do fellowships and also a lot of um, awards and prizes to individual artists. Uh, nationwide. Uh, before that, I was in the senior program officer position, mainly focused on professional development and also leadership programs. So not typically in the museum sector, um, but I do uh, work on a lot of culture exchange programs and also a leadership program in general. So interested in, you know, how uh, leaders work different ways in the US and also in China. Um, in the museum sectors. So very excited to join in here with all the awesome colleagues uh, on the panel and also meeting current and uh, alum from the MAM program and also CMU uh, students if you're not in the MAM program. Wonderful, Hung. Hi uh, everyone, my name is Hung Wu. Uh, I'm the curator of uh, Asian art at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria in Canada. So. Hello, good morning from the West Coast. I, so it's really uh, early in the morning, not really early, but it's nine o'clock in the morning. So it's still kind of dark outside. I hope my lighting on my face, the lighting on my face is okay. Look lovely. You look wonderful. Yeah. Uh, before joining the uh, Victoria Gallery, I worked at Nanjing Museum in China for 
seven, seven years. And uh, when I was working there, my main duty was to um, develop in international traveling exhibitions, both outgoing and uh, incoming. And also some international uh, programs. That's why that's how I uh, met Sean, the an another uh, panelist, and then Nick, Nick. Thanks for inviting me, Nick. I'm very glad to be here, and uh, because I um, always uh, have a special interest. Uh, how should I put it on the on Chinese museum and its international audience, and how this global museum uh, sector is uh, operating. So yeah, I'm I'm very glad. So. To, to discuss about this with all of you. Thank you. Okay. And last but not least, we have Sean. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Hello, uh, thanks for this great opportunity. And my name is Sean Yuan, and I'm currently a social curator of Asian art in San Antonio Museum of Art. Uh, San Antonio Museum of Art uh, is one of the leading uh, museums in Southwest of the United States. Uh, in, with encyclopedia collection um, of over 30,000 pieces covering all major cultures around the world. Um, Asian art is one of our strengths. And at this position, I had a great opportunity uh, working with many museums, several museums in China. So we had a, a formed a very positive relationship with those museums. Uh, in the past, I, like Hung mentioned, I used to, uh, I was involved in a project uh, with Hung and Nick uh, on the U.S. Museum uh, Museum Leaders Summit, one in New York in 2016, and then uh, earlier ones uh, involved uh, folks on U.S. Museum Summit uh, 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 meetings in Nanjing in 2014, I guess. Is that right? <laughs> that was a long time ago. But yes, um, really nice to be here and share my experience and thought on this on this topic. Great. So I think um, before we dive into the conversational piece, I just want to establish a, a quick baseline of what we're discussing in the Chinese museum boom. Um, in 2002, the Chinese State Administration of Cultural Heritage announced that by 2015, it would build a thousand new museums. This is an audacious goal. Uh, the total number of museums across China had been in the low triple digits since the 1970s. In 1978, for example, there were 349 museums, but by 2013, more than 1,500 new state museums had been erected, significantly exceeding their goal. And here I'm gonna put up a slide that will give you a sense of the kind of mind boggling velocity of museum construction. All right. Let's Right before the COVID-19 pandemic swept the world, China was in a museum boom, an unprecedented spike in museum construction across the country. And at the height of this, this boom, museums were opening almost daily. So today's panel is going to consider these new institutions, who runs them, what's in them, and why they're important. I will stop sharing. So we can perhaps start with the first question of who's running these museums. And fortunately, both Judy and Hung have firsthand experience working very closely on the, both with curators and directors of these museums. So we can start perhaps with Hung um, and you can describe the leadership of these institutions. Who's at the helm? Okay. Uh, speaking of museums in China, um, uh, for example, the museum I worked at previously, the Manchin Museum, which is one of the leading museums. And uh, I always say it's one of the best it's not because I work there, but uh, it used to be the central, like the, the central museum or the national museum of China before 1949. So uh, then after that, it was uh, renamed as Nanjing Museum. So uh, taking that museum as an uh, example, uh, the museum, um, you, when you ask, like you're asking who is the uh, leading this museum, I like a uh, short answer is the government is leading the museum. The government, which means um, the government in different layers. Like, uh, first of all, the museum is called the Provincial Museum of Jiangsu Province. So the museum was um, uh, uh, managed, not managed, but led by the provincial government of Jiangsu Province. But in the meantime, it's also, it's also the museum uh, receiving funding from the central government of China. So it's, it's called like a co- leading or co 
co-funding scheme uh, between the local government and the central government. And uh, this is a kind of, this is like a special feature of the museums in China. Like uh, the whole country has uh, around, uh, I think eight museums, like eight best museums selected by the central government to give additional funding on top of the local funding. So I guess like from the founding resource, maybe you can say who is leading the museum, but uh, in terms of who like a uh, daily operation, of course, the museum, <laughs> the museum, um, the director and all these uh, uh, museum like people working at the museum, we are, we are, we are not leading, but we are managing the museums, I should say. <laughs> yeah, is that to answer the question? I, I'm, it exactly. does. Um, and I think, Judy, you have experience with the curatorial side and who is kind of leading up the creative direction of these institutions. Yeah, I think I want to uh, add in some context for um, the audience here who may be not that familiar with the term we're using when we're talking about museum in China. So I think um, it's really broad idea. It's not only like art museum when we are talking about museum in the US, most of the time we are talking about art museums. But in China, there are also a large group of uh, archaeology museums, uh, which means um, because of the rich history, the museum holds a lot of objects. Um, so when we're talking museums, there are a very big part we are talking about that, that kind of museum, but also including art museums. So it's, it's kind of like complex, um, complex structure. Um, I think in China, based on my observations, many of the leaders of the, um, of the museums, um, they are either like I mentioned, appointed by uh, the governments, uh, or uh, they have very strong curatorial background just because uh, the museum itself, um, is focused on more cur curatorial side or because their collections are so strong that need very much attention um, to, um, curate and then to exhibit to the public um, from that perspective. But in the US here, most of the time you will see curatorial department is separate from the uh, executive director's position because uh, running a museum is a separate job um, from uh, running a curatorial project or curatorial um, department, uh, which you are focusing more on research and also the uh, pieces or the areas you are um, devoting to. So I think this is a big differences I see from the museum in China and the museum here uh, talking about the leadership. That's great. And that's a very important point is the difference between having a government run institution. So the next piece of this is what are actually in these museums, right? What are in the physical structures in terms of the collections, um, in terms of exhibitions? Uh, e, Sean? Um, I'll go ahead. Uh, in terms of collections, uh, like uh, Judy mentioned, um, um, the collections in the Chinese museums are a little bit di different from here in the United States. Uh, most of the um, art museums collections focus on archaeological objects. Those objects are found either in tombs or um, excavated uh, from underground. And there's a small portion of the art museum, so-called museums, for example, modern and contemporary art. This is very different from US museums. For example, San Antonio Museum Art, we have modern contemporary art department. But in China, uh, modern contemporary art, you're really in a separate museum, it's called art museum. Um, when you talk about museum in general, it's mostly archaeological objects. So, um, uh, like I said, uh, found from tombs or uh, from underground or some um, archaeological sites. Um, that's, that's the major part of their uh, uh, collections. Of course, mostly Chinese art. Uh, it's obviously over 95% or even more um, from Chinese art. Um, art from the uh, Western world is very limited. Yeah. Right, so to add to the um, contemporary art museums um, phenomenon in China, so they are definitely because I think since the beginning of this boom, we got a lot of criticism about Chinese museums are being just buildings without artworks inside, especially for those private modern and contemporary museums. But I think recently there are different type, typologies of collections are rising and some are still very market driven and whatever is popular they collect and they acquire because they have a lot of capital. And, but some of them are also 
uh, dependent upon those founders' personal collecting interest. I think it's very idiosyncratic. It's really hard to compare one museum to another museum. They're all very different. And um, some of the museums just built maybe five or four years ago. I see that there are more and more, I think they are getting a better track in terms of planning long-term curatorial strategies or collecting strategies. And I think there's one museum that's very interesting. It's called Zhi Museum in Chengdu. Um, they also have a Shanghai. So it's designed by a very famous architect and located at 40 miles away from the city of Chengdu. And uh, it's also backed by this mega company. So they are not lacking of any capital to fund their operation or any marketing. They just utilize whatever the company has to promote, to fund the, um, the museum. And the founder has a really strong personal collecting interest so the um, museum's collection is definitely informed by the personal interest. And uh, I think because the uh, architecture of that space is very um, traditional, it's very speaking to this uh, oriental uh, aesthetic. So they are trying to collect works that are going to be displayed in the space that's um, in the conversation with that building itself. I think it's hard to imagine in the US museum, they're collecting things to look nice in the building um, they have. And also they are very um, uh, forward thinking about collaborating with a lot of younger artists doing um, in interdisciplinary art between art and um, cutting edge technology like new media installation, AI technology, biology, all those cool things. I think, um, but even though their collections are still very small, like maybe a few hundred works. So I think Sean, you mentioned your collection is about like 30,000 pieces in your museum. I think at, at the Art Institute is even like 10 times <laughs> the 30,000, just the Arts of Asia department alone, we have 30,000 artworks. But I, I'm actually glad to see that they're taking smaller steps because you know the Chinese mentality is always about quantity or fast. I think they're trying to do little by little and be, being very serious about what they collect in their um, collection. And beyond collections, there are there's the actual presentation of these collections through exhibitions. What are some of the exhibition strategies that you see? Should I answer the question? Yeah, either, either you or Sean, or if Hung or Judy want to weigh in on this. Um, well, if can, uh, if can say something about that, I, I'll say um, most of the museums, I'll say probably over 95% museums in China are public museums, which means they're funded by the government at different levels, e either provincial, municipal, or central government, or both. Um, for those museums, their, their exhibitions tend to focus on history, either provincial history, regional history, or for example, the National Museum of China is focused on the history of entire China. So um, um, they do, recently they do have this kind of a special exhibition to focus on specific topics. Uh, I know Nanjing Museum recently had a few very good focused uh, temporary exhibitions whether uh, from their own collection or through international collaborations. Um, this is very, very similar to US museums in this way. Um, they have their permanent collections, focus on their collection, uh, their local history. Uh, in the meantime, they have the special temporary exhibitions focus on special topics. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> more international collaborations between U.S. and Chinese museums and uh, for the Art Institute, not only were um, between the uh, Art of Asia Department with the Chinese museums like Sean described, they're focusing on historical context and uh, we're, we're also exchanging artworks um, in the European department. For example, if we to get some loans of, um, of Chinese bronzes, but we may loan some Monet's paintings back. So that's very interesting because they definitely don't have that collection at hand, but they want to uh, open up the market or the audience, expose the audience to some Western Greek uh, masterpieces. 
was this interesting like trade kind of, uh, but not just art Asia to Asia or Chinese to Chinese, it's more broader. Yeah. I, uh, I just want to add something uh, based on uh, E's previous um, uh, descript description about your observation of these uh, new Chinese museums who, uh, who don't really have so many like, um, collections yet, and they are collecting something very modern, very contemporary. And uh, I think we, um, which point out a fact, I think uh, Sean also, Sean has previously briefly mentioned, but we haven't really <laughs> talked about it, is the, the um, museum, the term museum in English, it's, it's, um, has two terms in Chinese. One is called Guan, which is a museum we are talking about, like, like the Nanjing Museum I have worked at. And another is called uh, Mei Shu Guan. It's, it's what uh, Sean has said, it's called an uh, art museum, literally as art museum Mei Shu Guan. But the Main um, main difference is the museums. Guan, they were focused on they are focused on the archaeology and the history, and the, all these collections were kind of assigned by the government. But for these Mei Shu Guan, these art museums, they are only collecting things after 1949, like uh, the contem more contemporary side. And uh, what Yi has uh, obse observed about these, uh, like uh, most of these newly built museums, they are art museums or Mei Shu Guan. That's why they are, they are collecting these um, uh, more like art focused objects or pieces of work, like works of art. So yeah, it's, um, so it's, there's like a major dividing line between these two sectors. But in, in the US, I think when people are talking about museums, like the art is the first word will come into your mind. But in China, if we are talking about museums, uh, that's the term like objects, which, which is called um, wen wu, like cultural relics, is the term coming to the mind first. And we kind of keep moving through this difference between Chinese museums and US museums. And I think there's an interesting piece in which they and EU noted this of when they interface and sometimes the sort of differences or frictions of these. Uh, I know that in working on the US China Museum Summit, there were a lot of times we saw differences between the kind of interests of directors from US museums and um, the interests of directors from Chinese museums. You know, I'd love to hear more about some of the way or some of the kind of differences that you see. I think um, one such example maybe for Ian Chan would be just the velocity um, by which exhibitions are installed and are brought to life or the kind of logistical schedules that museums use? I think, I think one of the uh, major difference or um, um, challenges for US and Chinese museums collaboration is um, US museums usually have a very longer period for planning exhibitions. While in China, that's very short. Uh, this is largely due to funding. Um, differences because in the United States, we have to raise funds in two years or three years to fund for an exhibition, especially a major exhibition. While in China, this is not the case because most of the public museums in China are funded by the government. Their budget is annually managed, funded by the government annually. So that's why um, for Chinese museums, they, uh, their uh, time frame for planning and installing exhibitions is much shorter because they have to use the funds that allocate to them in that year by the government. Otherwise it will be gone. Uh, while here it's different because we have to raise penny by penny by ourselves, by our development uh, staff. So that requires longer time um, um, for, uh, for us. So, uh, that difference is uh, uh, timeline uh, um, sometimes create very big challenges for, for US and Chinese museums to partner on projects. So the funding is a challenge. Yes, here. <laughs> Sorry, I just, for the ma'ams, you know, let that sink in um, always. That's, that's going to be a mantra. Um, so 
beyond you know exhibitions what about programs and edu and education and other kind of aspects that are you know ancillary to museums uh, i i can add something um based on Sean's uh, response about the difference so in addition to the in addition to the time frame which is really a main challenge in the, like, uh, between the US and China, Chinese museums collaborations. Another thing, like uh, I have also observed some uh, other differences. For example, the, like uh, you, you are, most of, the, most of the students here are museum studies, right? So I, I also observe this diff difference between uh, museum people in China and the US. Like uh, we have different view on the, for example, objects, collections, like uh, I can just tell an example. When I was working at Nanjing Museum, we collaborate with a, uh, a museum in the UK, trying to uh, bring in an exhibition from the museum in UK. And uh, what the Chinese side has been, had been emphasizing on is the objects, like we want to see the objects, by which it means 3D like in many cases, like 3D objects. So oftentimes it refers to these historical, archeological ar ar objects, but in the, in, uh, in the mind or in the view of the uh, British colleagues, they also value a lot about this 2D, even like archives, historical documents. But in, uh, in, in the Chinese side, probably just thinking for the uh, audience of Ch like Chinese audience, maybe when they look at these archives, they would not think this is a museum object. So yeah, things like this, like small differences uh, in, 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 in different views on this museum uh, concepts, objects, collections, acquisitions, like uh, I think both, um, uh, not both, like US museums and Chinese museum side has different uh, views on, on things like this, yeah. Sure, and Judy, from your experience of um, mainly chaperoning curators around New York from Chinese museums, what were some of the initial impressions? That you, what are the kind of responses to American institutions that you observed? Yeah, actually I want to add in a little bit um, all the discussion we are uh, just had here. So I think um, the boom we are talking about is not only in the um, art museum side. I also see a lot of uh, regional museums or even uh, local museum focusing on very specific cultures that um, region, like say ethnic groups living in the region, they want to offer something special or like have some museum setting to host these content. So I also see a lot of building on that, uh, either on the private side, like a uh, private sector and also at a public sector. So it's um, it's a very interesting mix of different kinds of museums, uh, not only our museum um, are building up in China. Um, and also uh, talking about curators, uh, what I worked with or I um, had a conversation with when, we, when they did exchange program here in New York, uh, because many of them, they don't have art background. So it's, although we all use curatorial um, or curators uh, to describe, you know, the people we are talking about to curate the shows, but uh, here we are very specific about curators working in, in our sector. Um, so many of the time when we bring the curator over to the New York museums, um, there's like parallel lines I can see. They are talking about the same things, but with different contexts. It's challenging in the beginning uh, for both sides to understand each other. Um, it's a lot of like interpretations you need to do and also provide more context why this language or this term means something different uh, with your colleagues in another country. So I think this is also amazing part when, when you talk about culture exchange uh, because you can understand you can have better understanding or better uh, deep uh, knowledge about other cultures. Um, and also I want to bring it up in terms of the programming side. Um, I think in China, again, because I'm not in the museum sector, it's just my observation. 
Um, a lot of the programming has been put up uh, because of different reasons. It could be the museum do have very really strong collections and do want to present to the public, but also it could be some market driven um, things happening. For example, for private museum, it can be a funding coming in from a sponsor. Um, and this is actually a lot of art and technology pro projects have been put up in the Chinese museum because um, tech companies or um, private sectors have strong interest on that area, uh, which bring the program into the museum um, setting. Uh, compared to the US here, uh, museum is the driver of the programming, although funding is important, um, but we have the programming first and then we are build up the proposals or fundraising strategies to secure uh, the money or the financial means uh, for the program the museum are committed to. So I think this is slightly different and also reflect on the timeline. Speaking about the programs, if I may add a little bit on that, I think programming is really one of the uh, fields that Chinese museums developed quite a lot, tremendously in recent years. Um, I recall when I was little, in, uh, when I visited museums in China, basically there was no education programs for the public unless you wander around the galleries. But these days, I really saw uh, education department in many Chinese museums, especially major Chinese museums, really have very robust programming, very similar to what we are doing here in the United States, whether it's targeting school kids, families, or adults, um, or online talks, lectures, they're pretty much doing the same thing we're doing here in the United States. Um, another thing about the background curators in China, uh, their background is very different from curators here. Uh, in the United States, most of the curators have uh, uh, backgrounds in art history, while in China, most curators probably have backgrounds in archaeology, history. Uh, art history is a new program. It's a very new program recently added to universities in China. And I don't think there are any art history program before 2000. So it's, it's brand new. So that's why um, many curators in China uh, came from um, history, archaeology, uh, not from art history background. Right, so we have an awesome audience of um, and current and future arts managers, um, many of whom are, I think, I guess most of whom are US based. What opportunities, and this is for the full panel, like what opportunities do you think are available or would you see for US based um, arts administrators to collaborate, to work with, to engage with Chinese institutions? Well, well, I can see there are um, possibly two fields that uh, arts managers here can get involved. One, of course, is exhibitions, um, whether exhibitions coming to the United States, United States or exhibitions yeah. coming to China from here. Um, um, in those projects, um, really involves um, pretty much every department uh, in the museums, um, whether curatorial, registrar, exhibitions, fundraising, marketing, pretty much everybody. Another field that I can see involving arts managers from here is staff exchanging. Um, uh, from my experience working with colleagues from China, they're really eager to, uh, to visit the United States or to the West and learn uh, the best practice um, in the US museums, whether curatorial or education or marketing. So um, that staff exchange is really um, a key part for, uh, for both museums to gain more knowledge about each other and uh, make the partnership more smoothly. So yeah, uh, staff exchange and exhibition exchanges. Yeah, I'd like to add that because I know MAN program has a strong focus in the, uh, between arts and technology because we uh, recently collaborated with the Student Museum Art of Art in um, Beijing, well, in China, and uh, we did an online exhibition. So we basically um, hired some video, uh, like arts management, arts managers that are that understand like technology to help us to do some virtual reality kind of um, those new media to showcase 
the Chinese painting, like how the hand scrolls are um, opening up and how the stories and those narratives characters are moving. And I think in, in that um, opportunity, I, I, I think uh, there are a lot of advantages. If arts managers understand technology. I think this is a um, really big trend in China. They're definitely trying to do a lot more with the newer technology, different platform that's facing an uh, international audience. Wonderful. And I see our chat is filling up with questions. So I will have. Yeah, Nick, do you want me to try to uh, see if some of the students want to ask these? I didn't want to, I didn't know if you were at that point yet, or if you want to peruse, that's up to you. Uh, um, what are you feeling? So I am going to ask one last question of our panelists, and then we can turn it over to the student. I, I'm the most excited about the student questions personally. Um, me too. <laughs> this is a great group, but all right. So there's a popular historic framework that claims the 19th century was the um, was Britain's imperial century and the 20th century was the American century and that the 21st century will be the Asian century. What does the Chinese museum boom mean for, or what does it indicate or, of, about um, the future of Chinese culture, arts and cultural narratives? Um, what does this say about the role of China in the cultural sector? Well, I, I can um, start. I think I'm not seeing that so broad as a, at a cultural side. I'm more seeing that as individual side. So since we, we, uh, we just talked about us manager, what's the um, possibility for US-based us manager to work with uh, Chinese museums. Um, because of these museums are newly built, um, talents are essential. Um, and also they are building up content. So it means there will be more exchange opportunities um, globally. So I do see a huge, uh, future for us managers, upcoming us managers, no matter you are Chinese or you are US based, to work with these Chinese museums um, or the Asian museums in general, because we are developing, we are looking for talents, uh, and us managers are growing in that context. Already build awareness, like all of you here, you are learning something from our panelists or like uh, exchange ideas with us, it's already building in your career trajectory. So once you graduated, you can think about how you want to involve yourself into this global context, um, either in the museum or in other cultural institutions or cultural sectors. I think, I think the student asked a very good question. Um, it actually relates to the fundamental question, why there's a museum boom in China recently. Uh, it took the United States over 100 years to have the museums, uh, great museums, whether it's on the East Coast, Midwest, West Coast. Well, it only took China two, three decades to have hundreds of museums across the country. Um, one of the reasons uh, leading to the boom of museums in China, of course, is this rich history and a rich archaeological um, 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 uh, fundings. So those objects found in tombs, for example, the terracotta warriors found in China in 70, 1974, pieces like that really provide a strong uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, sources for U.S. museum, uh, Chinese museum, museums to expand their collections. So, for number one, they have objects to fill the museum collections. And number two, of course, the economy uh, and, and the, the booming of Chinese economy since the 1990s really gave the Chinese government, whether it's a central government, yeah. provincial government, or municipal government, rich financial sources to support those museums, build brand new museum buildings, expand the museum staff. So that provides the, the second most important sources for leading to a Chinese museum boom. And the number three, I think, is uh, the government, the Chinese government really wants museum play a role in rebuilding the narrative of Chinese history and um, promoting the pride of Chinese history and the culture amongst people. So uh, those three, uh, uh, factors combined that really leads to 
uh, the museum boom uh, we saw today uh, in China. It's wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So Jessica, why don't you feed us some questions? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just going through them and reading some of them. Yuhan, I asked if you would mind asking your question out loud. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my question is, as John mentioned, most art curators here in the U.S. have the art history background. And for people who don't have a background in art history, what are some suggestions would you give to them if they want to be um, art curators in their future career path? You mean China or in the United States? Um, uh, uh, in the United States maybe, but you can also mention like in China because I feel like it might be harder to be a creator in China, maybe. Um, Hung, uh, help me if, if, <laughs> if I'm wrong on any details. Um, I think um, in China, if you want to be a curator uh, today, um, um, the candidates definitely need to have advanced degrees, whether it's in archaeology, history, uh, or art history. Uh, there, I think they're still open to um, 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 background in archaeology and, and history in China. And plus, uh, I think it's it's more like civil servant positions, right? It's, it's, it's a public funded position. It's not like here, like a director or scene or a chief curator can make decisions of hiring curators. While in China, it's, it's not that simple. Um, uh, you need to have, I think, the staffing quota for that specific positions before you can apply because the museum is funded by the government. So they need to have make sure the funding is there, the quote, the staffing quote is there. Um, while in the United States here, of course, it's mostly require uh, advanced degrees in art history, uh, depending on your uh, interest, whether you're interested in Asian art or American art, European art, Islamic art, uh, you uh, need to have those uh, trainings uh, in uh, those fields, uh, yeah. So to, answer add question? <laughs> to add on to that, in the US, there's a kind of um, a sort of mercenary curator, curator class, right, of um, independent curators that, um, you know, will go from institution to institution, will work on, you know, um, in the commercial space and fairs and festivals. To what extent does that, if at all, exist in China? I'll let Hung speak on that. <laughs> I, sorry, I didn't really catch what, what can you repeat? What, what did you yeah, absolutely. So we have in the US, there's like a lot of independent curators that might not necessarily be affiliated with one institution and in fact pride themselves almost in not being like locked down to one institution. But given that so many Chinese museums are government run, to what degree can that or does that exist in China? Okay, sorry about this. I was still, my mind was still like uh, tangling on what Sean has been talking about. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yes, yeah. so for in speaking of uh, independent curators, I mean, again, we have to emphasize there's really like two museum sectors in China, uh, public museums, which is government funded and the private museums, which are most of these merely museums were, uh, so I think the for these contemporary um, private museums, uh, independent curators still is also one of the main, like main approaches they are applying today. But for the, for the museums, for the, uh, what's called the museum, uh, Boba in China, in China, the government founded museums, like the museum I have worked at, normally um, they don't really um, using like an independent curator or guest curator to do the exhibitions. So always in-house curators. And again, back to the, uh, the question the student asked about uh, the career, career path. Um, like, uh, it depends on what, uh, do you want to work for the museums or do you want to work for like art museums? Like in, in China, if you really want to join the museums, like archaeology museum or history museums, of course you, you can also focus on uh, other disciplines like, uh, like uh, Sean has, um, has mentioned. And uh, uh, like for me, I don't have art history background. My background is museum studies and uh, media studies. So when I joined at the uh, museum in China, that's why I was more focused on the international side. But uh, again, I, I mean, like even in, in, like in Canada, 
even if you don't have an art history degree, you still there are still chances to become a curator. Like in at our gallery, at our institutions, so we have a curator of engagement, which is very much more focused on education. So yeah, it really depends on the the, the definition of curator. The concept itself is changing. So I think there are multiple chances you can work in 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 a museum. Awesome, thank you. Um, I asked another student, Alex, if uh, she would be willing to ask her question out loud that she put in the chat. Uh, hi, um, this comes from a place of uh, naivete, certainly ignorance might be a better word. Um, I've, uh, I forget who mentioned it, but someone was saying that 95% of the exhibitions are Chinese artifacts or Chinese art in China. And I don't know that what the stat is in the US, but I'm, I'm guessing it's not that. Um, and I'm wondering if you could, I know there have been conversations around like the efficacy of presenting other people, other cultures of the country's art or artifacts in a different country, especially in a colonistic state like the United States. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to the benefits and the issues around that. And um, if there are ethical ways to present another country's art or their, their artifacts. Don E. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think that this is a very good question, excellent question. Yes, most of the exhibitions in China still focus on Chinese art, but the exhibitions focus on non-Chinese art is really increasing in these years. Because I think that's uh, one is due to the increasing um, um, the expanding size of Chinese middle class. They have the financial resources to travel abroad. So they want to learn more about those Western art in their home country. And another uh, uh, cause that leading to the increasing number of non-Chinese art exhibitions, especially from the West, is because the funding is increasing for many Chinese museums. So they have the financial sources to loan those exhibitions from the outside, uh, from, from Western world. For example, most recently, uh, Nanjing Museum collaborated with Royal Antari Museum probably two or three years ago on the exhibition of Fuxian Egyptian mummies. And uh, Shanghai Museum not too long ago collaborated with uh, the Clark Center in Massachusetts on uh, uh, impressionist exhibition. And not too long ago, Shanghai Museum also collaborated with the Terra Foundation in Chicago, um, an exhibition focused on American art, uh, modern American art. So uh, I'll say yes, there, if you travel to China, you will see more and more uh, exhibitions uh, from whether US collections or European collections. The most recent example is a Suzhou Museum, not too far away from Shanghai. They just not long ago, Last month, September, they opened the, this wonderful uh, exhibition of Roman Greek art from British Museum. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, uh, it's increasing actually at a very fast pace. Cool. Well, let's add that uh, it's definitely happening, but I see presenting art from other countries is less of a problem. I think for the US Museum, um, adding all the provenance information of the artworks in their own collections and returning back to maybe Asian countries is a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as uh, something, I feel like a lot of those Western um, exhibitions that are introduced to Chinese audience are still on a very in in introductory level versus digging really deep into like adding new scholar kind of conversations into the field is more about this uh, um, um, opening the door, let's get some exposure. Um, but I think on the, the other side, when, um, when I'm working at the Art Institute, we are facing a lot of issues about how we ethically present and collect works of art. And also the works that are collected 50, 60, 70 years ago, and all those, um, when there are a lot of uh, laws, regulations are unclear, a lot of uh, illegal, um, illegal, uh, excavation and things like that so it's true we could have an entire panel just on um provenance and restitution um that might be the next moment we assemble this group um yeah oh i, I know i totally agree i mean it's an interesting topic and i i wanted to have that question asked but yeah I, we could really legitimately have an entire uh, panel on that and maybe we will 
Um, we got an interesting con uh, uh, question from Anita. Anita, would you be willing to unmute and ask the question that you typed in? Because I do think that the commercialism of art is a little bit different in China. So I thought your question would be good for the panel. Yes, um, sorry, there's noise in my background. But my question is, uh, what do you guys think about the commercial elements? Um, actually, the strong emphasis of commercial elements um, in Chinese contemporary art museums specifically, and especially those in the Westbound Art Center in Shanghai. Um, and then um, I have witnessed, you know, the growth of those museums, but also like how they approach a commercial markets and how the collaboration between the museums and the, the you know, the brands kind of um, evolving over the time. Uh, yeah, so I just want to kind of hear about your all's opinion. I mean, it's a good question, and I, it's kind of interesting how I think Chinese museums can tend to be a lot less sacred about that. And I think maybe that also speaks a little bit to, I think, uh, Jaden, you, you had mentioned um, the kind of digital space as well and the kind of commercial partnerships that exist there. Yeah, I found that the Chinese, especially those were commercially successful than a lot of museums in here because this kind of uh, private public, this kind of uh, lines kind of blurry all the time. And uh, there, um, the birth of this hybrid realities are happening all the time um, in China. And I think for a lot of those art spaces, especially for contemporary, those art museums, and uh, they tend to rent out uh, space. I think we do um, those rental services too, but not just for like weddings, like. Uh, non-art related activities, but in um, museums in China, they do rent out spaces for temporary exhibitions and those things, and uh, they develop brand for their, their whole cultural entity, and then they sell those uh, products around um, exhibitions they do and uh, things like that. I think it's more successful, <laughs> more fluid, more flexible. Yeah, also I, I want to chime in that because the funding structure is different, there's no way to avoid, you know, the commercial side in China, especially for private museums, um, because you need a financial means and where the money is going to come from. So it's like really direct questions throw to all the private museums. If you have really strong uh, finance means from the company or the funder, that's good, but for other museums, into long term, you need to find a more sustainable financial ways to run the museums and also provide uh, public programs you are committed to. So I think also like you mentioned, um, in China, museums are open to these rental um, for art uh, art exhibitions. Not like here, uh, museums want to hold its own identity, so no rental will be offered to exhibitions or very limited because museums do see the exhibition put in their space as part of their brand. Uh, they want to build this um, reputations among the communities they are rooted. But in China, because of the development of the private museums, uh, they're definitely open to that. And they are building the brand along with these rental exhibitions, uh, especially for these art and tech projects. Um, if the museum seeing themselves to serve the younger generation, they are definitely open to these like art and tech or in immersive exhibitions, even as rental, it's not part of their programming. Um, they see that one way as an um, uh, option to getting more income from these rental. On the other side, they also see as a marketing for the museum, the name, like people start to recognize there's a museum around in my neighborhood and providing this kind of cool um, uh, exhibitions, especially in the young generation in China. Um, young people are really willing to um, experience these exhibitions. Um, you can say compared to here, the quality virus, uh, virus uh, on these, all these exhibitions put in there because it's just like, it's developing, it's not mature market. Uh, people are experimenting many ways to do exhibitions. But on the other side, that's good for young generations. Chinese young generations are getting used to go to museums or go to see exhibitions part of their leisure activities or leisure mm -hmm. time. Um, so it's sort of like a double edge in some way. Um, but uh, I, I see that it's more 
I think it's more benefit than I see hurting the market, but just my personal opinion on that. Everyone see that differently. Thank you. Commercialization of museums in China is mostly um, uh, for uh, those private museums um, who do not receive or receive very little funding from the government. So they have to find every means to raise funds to make sure uh, the museum is financially uh, viable. And, uh, and another thing, uh, which of course is another major difference between the museum world in the United States or museum culture in the United States and China is in China, uh, this kind of tradition of a philanthropic giving or donor base is not there. It's, un it's very unlike museums here. Uh, for example, whether Art in Chicago or St. Louis Museum Art, we have a board that are supposed to give money to the museum and also our development uh, staff really focus on cultivating potential donors, whether it's giving money to the museums or giving art collections to the museums. Uh, those kind of donor base is not there in China yet. Um, China doesn't have this kind of culture and history of, uh, of giving um, to public institutions. So that's why uh, those primary, private museums in China, especially in Shanghai and Beijing, um, renting out their space, having commercial, commercial exhibitions. For example, I recall a couple of years ago, I was in Shanghai, I saw this exhibition in a museum focused on Christian Dewar. Um, which is a little bit um, out of imagination here in the United States. If we have a Christian Dewar exhibition here, it's probably where we get a lot of negative media attention, I guess. But that exhibition was extremely popular in Shanghai. Uh, people waiting long lines, paying the ticket to see the exhibition. So yes, I think uh, uh, because of lacking government funding support, lacking a strong donor base, that make those primary museums in China really uh, uh, want to explore every means to raise funds uh, to support themselves. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna ask um, one more question that is sort of a um, aggregate of several questions because we also asked the students to send any questions that they may have had before the panel. And then I've also sort of seen this like within. So there are two questions I believe that we are going to, uh, so I'm just going to limit it to one here. I'll try to combine it all. All of you have graduate degrees. All of you have worked at some or did some schooling in China and then have um, also done some schooling um, or work in the US. And so for our Chinese students that are in the program, many of them just want to directly ask, you know, what is that transition like um, from grad school or undergrad here in the US to working in the US. And just, uh, I guess if anyone would like to sort of just comment on how their career between these two cultures and because of your education and because of where you're at, if you could give maybe a little advice to some of our Chinese ma'ams, because many of them had just specific questions about how your career went and where it's going and that sort of thing. Anybody? Well, I think I can talk <laughs> about the career trajectory a little bit as a MAM alum. Um, so for Chinese students, um, it's a tough question to, to answer, honestly, because it, it may be easier now for me to look back and tell you what's going on, like in past, um, after graduation, what I did. But it's tough when you're in the middle of that and thinking mm -hmm. how I can find a job here in the US or should I consider moving back to China and look into a, a culture sector and find job opportunities. Um, so I will, I will say it's not really advice, it's just like personal uh, opinions, like just follow your guts. Like if you want to be in the US, you do have OPT options. So it's not like urgent after graduation, you have to move back. You still can experience different job opportunities, apply for jobs or even internships in the city you like. So like my case, I moved to New York right after graduation just because even I consider moving back, I want to spend a year in New York. So that's my decision. I moved to New York and then I find a job. So you may feel it's easy to say like, oh, I moved to New York and now find a job, but it's just, I made a decision to move to New York and figure out what's going on afterwards. So uh, not really advice, but I think 
you should um, think about where you want to be after graduation as a first question. I think that's great advice, by the way, for international and domestic students. Anybody else have thoughts on this? Um, I'll go next. Um, I'd like to say that we, so this MAM uh, program, all the alumni graduated from the program, we stay very close. And I, I definitely benefited from uh, connecting with previous MAM students, like Judy is one of them. She's one of the <laughs> MAMs that I knew when I jumped off of the plane <laughs> from China. And I think that definitely helped. I think there's a really strong network in this field. So I think you just try your best to connect with some of us to get to know what's really happening and what the path uh, we went through. Um, I think that could be really helpful. And uh, when I, um, before I joined the MAM program, I was in a business background. I did an undergrad in business accounting. So I definitely just switched my career completely. And uh, I was also on a performance art track. I see Brad, Professor Brad is here. <laughs> she was my professor too. But the second year and I uh, decided to pursue a more like a visual art uh, museum career. And I was lucky to get the first job at the Carnegie Museum of Art. I think that five years of training should really help um, provide a very solid foundation for me to understand how museums work here, but also right around the time 2012, 2014, that was also the museum boom just we just talked about in China. So I was always observing, trying to see, okay, when can I jump on that bus? But I definitely feel like now it's 2021, it's definitely a better situation for international students and uh, to be part of this uh, uh, museum trend. They all want to be international. They all want to collaborate. I think there are a lot more opportunities um, now in terms of uh, projects and uh, collaborations, positions, museum didn't even think about it, needed them um, five, eight years ago. So a very different picture now. Nick, I'll come back to you and let you ask, ask any final question or a, a summary or anything else you want to talk about. I mean, this has been just a sure delight. And so like um, in a couple minutes, I'll ask everyone to unmute and applaud. But I just want to personally thank you for helping suggest this panel and organize it. And I'll let you have the final words. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I, mean, I think this has been a wonderful and robust conversation. Um, and I don't want to speak preemptively for the panelists, but I do want to reiterate the point that you really can, um, anyone can reach out to us to talk. Um, you know, we are all very sort of keen to meet the arts managers of the future um, and who will soon be our colleagues um, in many ways. So with that, I just want to thank um, this wonderful panel. And I wanted to thank also, you know, Jessica and Ross again for joining. And I see also some of the other MAM uh, staff and faculty have joined us as well. And I want to thank you for all of your generosity and support. And you know, last but not least, thank this wonderful group of attendees for joining us on this afternoon in, you know, this bizarre Zoom universe. I agree. Thank you all so much. It's it's uh, really tough to like dig in and sometimes have a conversation in this format, but it was so lovely to have such a nice audience and such nice panelists. So if you if you're in a place where you can unmute and give some applause. We will do so. Um, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Have a great day. I'll stay thank on you. the line. We'll stop recording, but I'll stay on the line if anyone had additional questions for me. But thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. And fantastic questions, by the way. Great questions.